God put two institutes in this world to reflect him better than anything else. One was the family, and the other was his bride, the church. In the family, he has at least four purposes in no particular order. One is to give the human race a way to expand, to procreate. Probably don't need to explain that much more than that. The second is to give us a way to comprehend the kind of love that God has for us and practice it with one another. The third is to train the young to know and love the Lord. And the fourth is to represent him, to win others to himself and his way of doing things. So God establishes marriage as this attractive institute that requires sacrificial living, yet offers security and love unmatched by anything else. And if we do it right, it brings people to the Lord. Now, with his church, he established an institute of community. In this, we grow closer in knowledge and love for Christ through worship, teaching, mentoring. In other words, through discipleship. From Peter down, who was first called to feed and care for the sheep, each person in the church is a disciple. That is, someone who's willing to come and learn and grow in the Lord, and a discipler, someone who's willing to reach people for the Lord, teach them, and help them grow closer to Him. In a nutshell, that is what a church is. It's disciplers and disciples. And while every individual is able and should reach those in their local circle of influence, the church can do something greater. It's the corporate arm of Christ. Here we can pull our resources together and do more to reach the lost, standing as a beacon of light in the darkness than we could do alone. So both marriage and in church, there's nourishment and eternal purpose. But what happens if something goes wrong? What if a God-ordained institute goes wrong? Maybe a man and his spouse, they're not living marriage the way that God designed it, and it's breaking down. Or if a church maybe got derailed somehow in its focus, it's not about God now. So we can't let these things collapse because there are living people inside. Whether it's a marriage or a church, there's another human there. It may be a spouse, it may be the kids, it may be our peers. We can't let it collapse. And the collapsing house is going to damage its neighbors too, just like this picture here. It's going to have an effect if our purpose is to win people to God and we let it collapse. It's going to have an effect on the neighborhood. So, for a godly institute that's in a state of disrepair, the stakes are higher than the institute itself. And so the people involved need to think higher and start delivering on a godly repair. But it's going to take commitment. It's kind of like an exercise program. Things didn't get that way overnight, and it's not going to be fixed in a day, not a month, maybe not a year, and by no human plans. It's going to take the Lord. But in the Lord, a fix can happen. Now, as we go, we're going to talk about marriage and church and other relationships. And I want to say up front, I know that there are difficult situations where someone has strived in the Lord. They want to fix something, and the other party just doesn't. Now, we're not talking about that today. We're going to presume that all the parties involved want the repair to happen. They want the godly institute to be fixed. And let's say the work started a while ago, and progress is being made. But let's say now that the forces of evil... Satan and his, and his armies don't want this godly institute to be repaired, and they're going to bring up things against it. Does it sound like a movie you'd want to see? I'd like to see the movie. We'll have to talk to the Kendricks about that. So can we find something in Scripture to motivate us when the forces of darkness are standing against our rebuild? Well, I think we can. I think we can find it right here in Nehemiah chapter 4. A little background first. In the 6th century B.C., the Babylonian Empire had swept away the nation of Judah. Up to 30,000 of its most important doers had been taken away. The, the leaders, the, the army, the artisans, the craftsmen, all the people who make things happen are swept out of the land. And not only that, but they wiped out the land itself. So what was left is char and ruin. The, city was left, the cities were left in rubble. And the reason this happened is because a long time before... The people had stopped making things about God. They had turned their eyes away from the Lord. And despite prophet after prophet, like Je Jeremiah saying, turn around, look at God, look at the purpose in this, they didn't listen. And so God left them to themselves. But God was at work even in the exile. The trials revived their dying faith. And they began to turn back 
to the Lord, and he miraculously restored them in their own land. And the book of Ezra tells of a rebuild that took place in the temple and in the faith. That's Ezra. And now Nehemiah. Trouble looms ahead because there are neighbors around who don't want the institute rebuilt. See, they like living in depravity. So they raise their armies against it. And what God will do is soak the spirit of Nehemiah. A godly man who wants to do the right thing. And so he sends Nehemiah to the king and says, Hey, I've got this burden. What can we do about it? God blesses it. And the walls begin to be built. And that brings us up to chapter 4. That's where we are right now. As we go into this chapter... Let's build a proposition that we can apply to our own lives. And here it is. No matter how broken a godly institute is, a rebuild can happen if we follow five principles that we'll find in these chapters. Number one, there are enemies who do not want a godly institute rebuilt. And they will act on that. Number two, the right response always starts with prayer. Number three, if derision will not derail you, you can expect attacks. Number four, when the attack comes, be armed up. And number five, when the battle is over, tighten your chin straps. We're going to look at these one at a time. And let's just see if these play out. Number one, there are enemies who do not want a godly institute rebuilt, and they will act. Let's look at verse one through three in Nehemiah chapter four. When Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish this in a day? Can they bring stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What are they building? Even a solitary fox climbing on it would break down their walls of stone. So here we see animosity right away. Uh, Sanballat or Sanballat, however you want to say it, his name means sin is life. So you kind of see what he's about. He doesn't like what he sees. He sees the godly institute being rebuilt, and he becomes angry. Well, really, the Hebrew word here means hot. He's hot about this. So he starts firing shots across the bow to try to scare the workers off. Listen to this again. What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? And predictably, other people join in. You had that happen on the playground before, right? Once someone jumps on you, somebody else is in. Can they rebuild the stones back to life, burned as they are? This is harsh and discouraging words. So things might start with put-downs. Try to take you off your track. And now, I do want to qualify this before we move on. There may be times... When you're heading down a road and someone will express concern and they do have your welfare in mind, all right? I mean, maybe if you're a church, you should not follow Brother Belial's advice and open up your sanctuary to the Satan worshipers to show that you support the community. Maybe not a good plan, unless maybe you're going to do it in July and you're going to take off the air conditioning and you're going to put little sticky notes all around so when they meet, it says, do you think it's hot now? I mean, maybe you're doing it for that, but usually it's not a good idea. Maybe it's good advice. We're not talking about that here. We're talking about enemies, people who do not have your best in mind. And as we go, we're going to use sort of an imaginary marriage uh, to make some contemporary points uh, so that we can kind of bring this into our own lives, help us relate. So let's go to that analogy. Let's say that someone in a marriage that's broken is started to kick things off by expressing it's broken. They've taken some risks, and they've gotten their partner to recognize it. And through a lot of hard work, hope in the Lord, things are moving along. Progress is being made in the marriage. It's being restored. So hopefully one day, it'll represent the Lord again. Well, someone doesn't want this to happen. So mocking starts. They may start making your rebuild efforts seem ludicrous. And there may be a lot of reasons. It may be envy. Maybe they don't have what you have. And they want it. Maybe they want what you have. They want your wife or your husband, could be. Uh, Maybe it's hate. They don't like what this 
Institute represents because it kind of stands against what they represent. They don't like it. Maybe it's pride. Maybe they want to see themselves as having the best thing or having the most influence or whatever. Could be all of this. Maybe they had a marriage that fails and misery loves company, so they don't mind dragging you down with them. So for whatever reason, bang, the shot comes across the bow. It might sound like this. Are you kidding? Look at this mess. You can't put that back together. Or it might be sneakier. You know, don't you deserve better than that person? You know, wouldn't it be easier just to X, Y, Z? We're talking about malicious people who don't want what's best for you. But it can sound pretty good. Let's go back to our chapter and see in Nehemiah's example, how did he deal with this? So he's having the put-downs happen, having the mockery. What does he do? Here it is, number two. The right response always begins with prayer. Let's see what he says. Verse 4. Hear us, our God. We are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them up over to plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. So pressure is mounting from the outside and probably coming from the inside. Advice to throw in the towel, scorn that hits right at the soft spots. Now, does Nehemiah get his hackles raised? Does he go, oh gosh, and start to defend himself right away? Or does he get scared, tuck and run? No, no, no. He takes it right to the Lord. And this is a good move, but it's hard, right? I mean, you ever had some jerk just pointing right at your soft spots, pricking on you, and you you just want to respond so bad? But you, it's hard to do it. And you always wish you had done it, you know, if you, if you didn't. So he takes it to the Lord instead. But here's what he does. He doesn't react right away. He sicks God on them. Now, does that seem weird to you? You know, he sicks God on these people. How does he have the confidence to do that? We should stop here for a second. Because this is not normal. I mean, how often have you sicked God on somebody? When's the last time? If somebody says yesterday, don't tell me about it, okay? I mean, it's not something we normally do. It's pretty audacious. He must know that he's in the right here. How does he know what they're doing is a God thing? Don't you think that's a fair question to ask? I mean, if he's going to be this bold and have God rout his enemies, he needs to make sure that he's really doing what God would say. Well, how do we know? Well, let's see. There's a couple ways to know. Let's say you're getting up one day, and you go to get your favorite shirt, and it's on fire in the closet. It's on fire, it's not burning up, and then it starts talking to you, telling you to do something. That's a God thing. (laughs) There's no doubt about that. That's a God thing. Now, with a marriage, and that's why we're going to use marriage as our example today, you know, God is always going to be behind you restoring a marriage, putting it right by Him. He's always going to be behind that. So it's a God thing. With everything else, it takes some discernment. You got to kind of go through some steps and make sure it might look like this. Say a person, it might be one of the married marriage partners or a, a leader of a group or something, starts feeling that God may be leading him or her in something. And they say, well, I want to make sure this is not me, so I'm going to pray over it for a while. And they pray over it for a while, and the, it just doesn't go away. And so they then tell someone else who they trust. Maybe in a group, it would be kind of a leadership group. They would say, you know, um, I've been feeling this thing for a while. And I just want to share it with you. I think God is talking to me here, but I want to make sure, will you go pray on this? And you tell me what you think. All right, this is prudence we're talking about. And then they go and do that and say, sometime later they come back together and say, you know what, we're feeling this too. You're right, we went and prayed on this and we think this is something we might want to risk doing. So what we think we ought to do is do some prudent planning, risk management, and then take a step and see if God blesses it. Now, if there's a bigger group to tell, then you go do that. You you present it, and you say, you know what? We're not trying to presume on the Lord here, all right? But we're feeling he's leading us in this direction. The only way we're going to know is if we take one step. I mean, we're not talking about jumping to the end. We're going to take a step and see if he blesses it, all right? So they take a step, and if God blesses it, here's what it might look like. Doors open. Even though things are tough, doors open up. 
things get fixed, resources raise up, maybe checks coming from nowhere with money amounts on it, people you never heard from in years go, hey, you know what, I remember what you guys did to me back in whoever when, can I help you with something? Things like that start to happen. And then spirits raise up, and people start joining in, it grows. So you say, whoa, God is blessing this. Or maybe you take that step, and he's not blessing it. What would that look like? Doors close, resources dry up, stuff breaks, people start disappearing. You say, whoa, maybe God is not in this. So the prudent person says, what do we do now? If it's a blessing, let's jump all in. You know, risk it all, because he is in this. If he's not, you say, well, you know, I'm not sure why, or um, maybe you're sure. Oh, I know why he wouldn't be in this, or maybe you don't know why, but you say, he's not on this road. Let's go back and make a different choice. That's what you do. Now, knowing that Nehemiah is a planner, we can see that in 1 through 3. In fact, he's my second favorite Bible character, not for chapter 4, but for 1 through 3. And so one time we'll get to talk about that. You can see how well he plans things out, and you know he's thinking this stuff. You know, when he went and took his thought to the king, he's thinking, let me look and see if God seems to begin this. What would he see? He would see the people got delivered from exile resources needed to rebuild the temple rose up the temple got built the law got read the nation got rededicated looks pretty good so far then when he felt an urge to rebuild the wall he got a grant and cash from a wicked king and he didn't even ask for it i mean that's pretty big so then he goes he goes into town he says here's what happened i got the grant the cash let's do it more people get involved everyone's excited the walls are halfway up now i would say god is in this so With a lot of confidence and good conscience, he can sick God (laughs) on the mockers because he knows God is in this. Now, you think we could follow that example? I think it would be a great example in our life. We can say, you know, I think God is in something, and I'm feeling some pressure, but there's no need to be rash. There's no need to lash back or run away either. He's in it. He's going to handle it. Now, in our scripture, Nehemiah knew the rebuilding of the walls was more important than his feelings. Back to our marriage partner, they got to know the same thing. They got to know that fixing this marriage is more important than hearing what the naysayers are saying. They got to keep on the task. Sometimes they might even have to change friends. I had to do that when I was about 21. I said, whoa, you know, I, I don't know how I did it. It's probably my fault, but I put myself right in a group of people who are not helping me to live the way I know I need to. I had to totally change my friend set. Three years later, I meet Claire. Never regretted it ever since. So sometimes we got to do that. Now, let's make a transition here. We'll say that we managed to do this. So we know we're on the right task, and we ignored the mocking. Now, that's going to be the end, right? I mean, when people, bullies come to get you and they try to get your attention, and that, that's the end, right? You figure they probably say, that's fine, Nehemiah, you win. We'll go home. You ever met a bully that does that? No. What happens next? We'll find out. Okay. I think that tells you <laughs> what happens next. All right. Number three, if the derision does not derail you, you can expect attacks. Verse 7, when Sembelet, Tobiah, and the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead, and the gaps were being closed, they became very angry. They plotted together to come up and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble. So they step it up, right? The jeers didn't stop things. Now they start plotting to make war. Things are getting serious. The principle is, if mockery won't work, they're going to get violent, especially if this is some godly institute, right? Satan does not like that. And if he can't get your attention away from it, he's going to attack it. In our marriage, maybe it looks like this. You know, um, this marriage used to be looking so good, and it got derailed, but they recognize it. They're putting it back together, and he doesn't like that. So he started trying to give them reasons to think it might not go back together, but they worked through that. But let's say the work is hard. It is hard to fix things, is it not? It takes a lot of energy. And maybe the the partners are tired, and they just need someone to talk to, to tell them how they're feeling as they're working with each other and struggling through this. And let's say they're not getting Christian counsel, whether professionally or privately. Opportunity knocking. Let's say the wife, it could be the husband, and we'll go there in a minute. Maybe she started having some conversations with some guy at the gym. You know, I mean, he just ends up at the treadmill the same time she is, and 
and he seems so nice and so understanding. And before she knows it, she's just sharing all the gory details about what's going on with her and her husband. And, and he just listens and says, oh, wow, that's so tough, you know. And it's so nice to hear someone so supportive because her husband is a big old pain in the rear end. And so it's really nice. And one day, eventually, he says, hey, you know, why don't we go have coffee sometime? Let you talk this th over. Okay, well, let's leave her tottering on that cliff, and let's go to the husband and say he's in the office, and there's this woman there who's been hearing him. And he doesn't know exactly when he started talking to her about all this, but it's just so nice. She's so understanding the way his wife used to be. That's what he thinks, you know. Um, and one day she says, wow, you know, that's really a lot you put up with her. Maybe, you know, you want to go have lunch sometime, talk about this? Okay. Are your shields going up? Anybody's? Going, this is not a good idea. You know, even if a marriage is going happily ever after, this is not a good idea. If it's like this one, and they're having trouble, I would say this is like putting WD-40 on your feet, standing on a muddy hill in a rainstorm. I don't know what that means, but it's not good. All right, so think, <laughs> this is a dangerous situation. You know, I have a policy in my own life, and I don't project that on you, and that's this. I do everything I can not to be alone with a member of the opposite sex. I just do. And if it happens and I can't avoid it, I make it as brief as possible. And that's what I do. Now, I don't project that on you. And that's really not the whole point. The point is this. We have a couple here who is in dire straits. They are not happy with each other. All right? So the tempter stuck something in there that's going to be an extra problem. Someone who, through eyes that aren't seeing everything, looks better. And they start spending time with this person. That's danger, folks. That's danger. And I see it at work all the time. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I know I see doing that. They go off with someone at lunch. Three months later, they say, I can't believe I... Re really? You can't believe it? I mean, I can believe it, you know? And so then they regret things for the rest of their life. Now, this person who's at the gym or at the office, they may or may not have bad intentions. The enemy is Satan. This person's probably a victim, too. The war is spiritual. But that doesn't mean you don't arm yourself up like a dog, right? Because your marriage is what's important. So let's go back to Nehemiah. They're about to be under attack. It's a different kind of attack, but the strategy is the same. Here it comes. Number four. When the attack comes, arm up, prepare for battle, nine through tell. We prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out, and there's so much rubble, we can't rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies are happy about this. They said, Before they know it or see us, we'll be right among them and kill them and put an end to their work. Then the Jews who were near them came and told us ten times over, this means again and again and again, wherever we turn, they're going to attack us. There's a great balance of prayer and action here. He goes to prayer again. But then he acts, he puts a guard in place. But here's the key. Nehemiah knows this is not going to be enough. This one action is not going to do it. He's the leader, he's the planner, he's the motivator. He's got to stay with it now. Because if you see, the people are wearing down. In verse 10, it says they're tired of the work. And not only that, someone's about to attack them. And they're freaking out in fear. That's 11 and 12. And... The enemy feels good about this. They feel confident they can take us out. This is a scary moment for the forces of good. They are afraid, and they need hope. All right. So what's going to happen? Is this exciting? I mean, this would be a movie you'd want to see, right? Oh, what's going to happen? Now, we know it's going to turn out good, so you can keep paying attention. It's not going to be bad. So here we go. 13 through 15. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. And here's the great part. And when I saw their fear, I rose and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your families, for your sons and daughters, your wives, and your homes. Where an enemy's heard what we were, that we were aware of their plot and that God frustrated it, 
we all return to the wall, each with our own work to do. Now, that's pretty awesome. So time to arm up. And the arm up's not going to be enough. He knows that. The people are tired. Panic is set in. They may be posted on the walls, but they're shaking. <laughs> they're terrified because they see this big scary army coming. So Nehemiah gives the speech of his life. He dispels the fear of something big by reminding them of something bigger. Hey, you know what? They got an army. You got God on your side, all right? We can do this. You ever seen a movie like that? Oh, and then he reminds them what they're fighting for. You're fighting for your kids. You're fighting for your wife, for your homes. Is that not enough for you? And they go, yes, let's do it. They're getting excited. Have you seen a movie like this? Like the Seven Samurai or the Magnificent Seven or something like that where somebody takes a group that's downtrodden and he turns them around with this amazing speech that reminds them what they're fighting for and all of a sudden they're a force to be reckoned with? Well, my favorite is this one. We're going to show it now. Hold your ground! Hold your ground! Sons of Gondor! Of Rohan! My brothers! I see in your eyes the same fear that would take the heart of me. A day may come when the courage of men fails, when we forsake our friends and break all bonds of fellowship. But it is not this day. An hour of wolves and shattered shields when the age of men comes crashing down. But it is not this day. This day we fight. By all that you hold dear on this good earth, I bid you stand, men of the West! All right, who wouldn't follow that guy? I'd follow that guy to the end of the earth. In our, in our Bible passage, Nehemiah is that guy going back and forth in the ranks, inspiring them to overcome unbelievable odds, taking this worn-down group and turning them into a fighting force. It's amazing, is it not? And the enemies are pretty amazed, too. What'd they do? We didn't even have to fight. They tuck and ran. They're terrified because they realized, oh, you know what? I thought I picked up a kitten. I picked up a tiger. I'm getting out of here, and that's what happens. Let's go back to our marriage and see if we can do that. So here's what's going on. The work has been hard. They're tired. But they waved off the mockery. Now here's what needs to happen first. Each partner needs to go back to that person and take that really nice offer to go have lunch or coffee and say, no thank you. <laughs> All right? Not harshly, but not too concerned about the offense either. Because it's the marriage they need to defend. But here's the thing. This one thing isn't going to do it. Staving off this one attack is not enough. This marriage still has a lot of problems. If they're going to survive, one of the partners is going to have to do like this guy. He's going to have to stand up and be the hero, be the discipler. Even though both want to fix it, you know this is true. One is going to end up having to take the heavier load. Maybe it's not fair. It's real life. All right, and Because the marriage is under attack, one of them is probably weaker than the other. And so this person may have to hold the partner up, take them along, urge them forward as they strive in the Holy Spirit, maybe even stand up on the kitchen table with their combat boots on and their, I don't know, a skillet on their head like a helmet and say, you know what? It may be right that a wall is going to fall down this day. It may be true that a marriage is going to fail. But it's not going to be this one because it's too important and I love you too much. And even if you walked out right now, I would never give up on you. I would never stop praying and never stop striving. So you decide what you're going to do. But I'm for this. You know what? I heard that in the first year of my marriage. And it changed my life. When I was ready to give in. When we had an argument, I said, why don't we just get a divorce? You know, because I remembered my dad walking out when things got really hard. And it's hard to overcome that. I knew it could happen. But she said that, and it changed my life. Sometimes you need a Nehemiah like that to say, you know what? A church may die, but it's not going to be this one. Because I love you too much. And it's too important. And thank God I had a Nehemiah in that moment. Our couple won a battle. But let's see what they need to do now. Number five, when the battle is over, tighten the chin straps of your helmet. Now, back in the scripture, this is where it gets pretty neat. 
The mocking has been thwarted. The attacks derailed. But now they got to move forward because it's not over. Let's look at 16 through 18, maybe then up to 23. 16. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried the materials did the work with one hand held a weapon in the other. Each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked, up to number 23. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon even when they went for water. So Nehemiah rallied the troops. And the rebuild is happening. The people are vigorous. They're motivated. Each person has a helper now. They're getting this thing done because it wasn't enough just to win the battle. They're looking long term. Our marriage partners would look like this. They stayed on task. They got through the mockery. They made it through the attack. They said, no, thank you, to the temptation. They're rebuilding this institute that hopefully one day is going to stand for God in their community. 17 through 23 shows us how that's going to happen. The enemy hates the institute. He's never going to stop. He hates marriage. He's never going to stop. I mean, just look around today. Burdens are shared. The two start to act as one. Total commitment, total trust, one house, one bank account, one everything. And they keep reaching to God, keep reaching to each other, showing real love to each other, patience, kindness, self-control. There's protection policies they put in place, nutri- n- nurturing behaviors. Ooh, it's hard to get that one out. Commitment to community, godly purpose. That way, when they start living right in the middle of the world and represent God to that world, they'll be attractive. They'll withstand it, and fruit will come of it. God will be glorified because now they're not thinking about them anymore. They're thinking about how can we use this to bring people to us. Now, I'll tell you this, Claire and I don't have a perfect marriage, but I can tell you that we are both focused on, and I don't think anyone would ever deny that we are trying our best to use our marriage to glorify God and to do anything we can with it. And it does help you to not think about yourselves quite so much. If we're talking about a church, here's what it might look like. Let's say we've been talking about a church rebuild this whole time. The work has been hard, impossible by human standards, but God delivered the goods because they verified it. He's in it. The people put their hearts and minds back on him. So their hearts are filled with vigor, their eyes on God. Worship is huge. Preaching is heavy on the word of God, light on human wisdom. Broken people are welcomed in so they can be fixed. Experienced Christians taken on -on one-on-one, less experienced, mentoring them, tutoring them. People are picking each other up, carrying burdens, encouraging each other. Everyone's discipling everybody, and God's army is raised. Now we're ready to go do something with this thing. Everyone starts taking this God out into the street with love, grace, and determination, and the community is changing. As those seeking the light are finding it, And those who are afraid of it are running away. There could be no settling back into comfort zones now. You're winning. Any who played any sports, this is the moment. We're about to win. Well, you can't stop. Let's keep going. And we're almost done. You got to be like this right here. There's a Japanese term. It's called zanshin. It means when you think the battle's over, you strap on because there's more to be done. That's our guy up in the left. On the right, it might be an athlete. In the game, in the ready, hunched in, ready to go, ready to leap forward, a champion, never stopping, never becoming too comfortable. A champion player, marriage partner, church, and the reason for the focus is the mission is bigger than we are. And God will be glorified if we stay on the mission. So here we come to a conclusion of this. This is the so what moment. That's what Charles Swindoll calls it, and I love that. So what? We've heard all this. What are we going to do with it? How do we take these five things and apply it to our personal situations? Anytime we're trying to rebuild a godly institute, whether it's a self, a marriage, a church, or anything else, number one, we got to know the battle's real. There are going to be enemies who don't like it. We might as well not let it surprise us. Number two, We should start with prayer. Always we should start with prayer. Number three, 
if mockery and downputting won't do it, expect attacks. It's going to happen. Number four, when that comes, be armed up and ready to go. And number five, when the battle is over, tighten your chin straps. So that's the five. Where might we be in this? Well, maybe uh, there's a godly institute that's broken and it needs to be rebuilt. And somebody is going to have to step forward and be the Nehemiah. All right, so maybe that's someone's position today. Because the work is hard. Someone is going to have to be the strong planner with deep love, a gentle heart, great vigor, and probably alligator skin. <laughs> All right? If that's you, you're going to know it when that happens. Because you're probably not going to want any part of it. And that's how you're going to know it. <laughs> Step up and do it. God will be glorified. Maybe, maybe you're the partner or the church that's blessed to see a Nehemiah step forward. Someone who just blazes with the gifts of leadership, vigor, love, and encouragement, so bright that you say, God's hands must be in that. Well, that's God's gift to you. That's how you know he's with you. Pitch your tent there. God will be glorified. But maybe, maybe for someone, it's different. Maybe this is an individual thing today. It's not about... Um, you stepping up to be the Nehemiah for a group. It's not about you recognizing that Nehemiah and getting behind that person. It's just you and God. You're an individual. You and your relationship. Maybe a life that's gone off track. Well, you know, you can give that life to God today. You can say, I've done what's right in my own eyes long enough. You take the wheel. You be Lord of my life. If you do that right now, he will do that right now. It's that easy. The start is easy. (laughs) The life is more challenging. The start is easy. Maybe you did that. Maybe you did give your life to Christ one day. But it's been a long time, and and life kind of muddles your focus, and you feel like you're a bit derailed, and maybe God is not leading your life now. You can say, hey, bring me back on track. Take the wheel again. God can do that. Because here's the thing. Whether you're the church, the marriage, or the individual, there's a mission, and it's bigger than you. We have a mission to do. We, our marriage, our church, is supposed to be about reaching people, winning them to Christ, and discipling them. Period. End of story. Whatever else we want to put on it, that's the mission. And if that's not our mission statement, we got no mission statement. We might as well take off our rings, close the doors, and be done. But if that is our mission statement, we're on the right mission. And we got to keep it going. God will be glorified if we keep on going with the mission. Maybe there's a fourth person here. Maybe you're not any of these. You're not um, the church looking for a Nehemiah or the marriage partner looking for a Nehemiah. You're not that person who's supposed to be the Nehemiah who needs to step up and, and drive forward. Maybe you're not an individual who's looking for the Lord. Maybe you're a victim of a broken institute. You know, maybe you tried in the Lord to make it work. You weren't perfect, but you toiled really hard. You risked, you gave your all, and you still got broken. Well, I do have encouragement for you, too. The Lord knows that you did your part. It's okay to let your spirit rest if you truly did everything you could, you are not responsible. Just let it go. Now here we are at the end, and let me just say this. If if anybody has anything running around in their brains right now based on what we talked about, you're in any of these positions, and you just need someone to talk to, please know we will stick around. You can talk to anybody who you've seen up here. And you're not wasting our time. You are our time. That's why we're here. So please come and talk to us. If you want to give your life to the Lord, if you want to get back on track, if you just feel broken from something and just want to tell somebody who you know is not going to do anything weird with what you tell them, we'll listen to you. And we won't have all the answers, no. But we can help you go to the Lord, who does, and who has all comfort, and I promise you we will. So please come and talk to us if you need to. Let's pray. Dear Lord, when godly institutes need to be restored, enemies will certainly strike 
against that because he doesn't want you to be glorified. Now, I know that my best efforts um, can't communicate what my heart wants to for you because they're just not good enough. But I know you've been working this hour. Maybe some here need encouragers. Help them see the encourager and hold on to them. Some here may be encouragers. Give them the boldness to step up and encourage. For some, it may be more basic. They need you. Reach down to them, Father. Lift their faces toward you. Maybe they're having trouble stretching enough in faith. Help them stretch. Some may be downtrodden, broken by another or others. I pray you cast down the downtrodders, lift up the uplifters, and help the broken break free. I give all this to you today. In Jesus' name, amen.